I'm delighted to welcome you to this uh, webinar this afternoon, which City Forum, the policy analysts, are holding jointly with the City of London think tank ZN. And we're particularly pleased to be working with Michael Manelli, Alderman of the City of London, Sheriff, and e expert on economic and financial questions and on technology and on security also. The event has been uh, prepared as part of a series on global Britain in a period of polarization, a period of uh, gray zone tension and hybrid conflict. It's been developed with the help of BA Systems Applied Intelligence, without whom we wouldn't have been able to arrange this series at all. We're very grateful to BA Systems for their uh, help for this and other parts of, of the particular activity. And we've been guided um, very helpfully indeed by members of the um, sort of Ministry of Defence, by senior officers and by other officials and by officials from other government departments um, who've asked us to um, include various questions and suggested it might be worth exploring others as part of um, this series. We had an earlier discussion on the 10th of July, which featured uh, Madeleine Moon, who is, we're delighted to see is back again to, to take part in the, in the uh, second conversation. And we're joined by Francis Tusa, journalist and publisher of Defence Analysis, whose French views have, have always um, been uh, particularly interesting to us at City Forum. And they will be joining Michael, uh, who is, is a, a polymath and, and, and uh, has interesting uh, sort of some views on so many aspects of the global Britain question. We were to have had a comment from uh, Marshal Edward Stringer, uh, but he's unable to participate in the discussion today, though he and his colleagues will be attending and will be looking forward to the report which City Forum will produce at the end of this um, project. The webinars will go on from here to include a number of further web plays, podcasts, and the final uh, sort of webinar exploring the issues that Britain will face. We're trying to look at what does Britain face? What can we do? How can we do it as essentials to this particular discussion? Michael is guiding us over to you. Well, thank you very much, Mark. And it's a real delight uh, to be working with the City Forum team. Uh, and I'd like to welcome Madeline back and uh, Francis for the first time. Uh, I'm looking forward to today's discussion. In a bit of background preparation, uh, one of the things I did was to go and see what gov.uk uh, gov says about Global Britain, uh, delivering on our international ambition. Uh, and the wording uh, specifically is the shifting global context, a new relationship with Europe, and the delete to deliver more with finite resources requires us to evolve and enhance how we achieve our goals. We need to use government assets more cohesively and efficiently to maintain our global standing. Global Britain is about reinvesting in our relationships, championing the rules-based international order, and demonstrating that the UK is open, outward-looking, and confident on the world stage. How can you object to that? Uh, interesting stuff. So the way that we'd like to structure it today is uh, I'm going to give a few comments about Global UK, uh, turn to Madeline and then Francis for their remarks, and then we're going to spend approximately six or seven minutes on three different areas, international stability and security, defense and security prioritization, and strengthening our global position. And we have a couple of comments already coming in from the audience. I might remind all of you out there that the GoToWebinar facility is particularly good in allowing us to engage in questions, answers, and take comments. It doesn't always have to be a question. Uh, so simply uh, send those to me and I will try and feed them into the discussion with Madeline and Francis. I'd just like to turn to uh, the very first slide and make a few opening remarks here. Uh, that statement from uh, .gov.uk, which sounds all fantastic and wonderful, uh, was laid out in a little bit more detail in uh, the Prime Minister, then Prime Minister Theresa May's speech in May 2017 at Lancaster House. And she emphasized four pillars. Uh, the first was free trade with the EU. Uh, the second was free trade outside the EU, most notably uh, with the United States of America. The third was to be working on science and innovation policy jointly with the EU, also dependent on an EU agreement. 
uh, and then to use hard power cooperation, as she termed it, uh, in areas of crime and terrorism, and she singled out Russia. Now, it's very interesting because in the last week, the government has effectively said, don't count on a trade deal with the EU, knocking out two of the pillars. Uh, don't count on a trade deal with America, uh, knocking out the third pillar. And by the way, uh, surprise, surprise, uh, Russia is a threat to our security and we don't appear to be doing much about it. So interesting uh, that in the past two years, not a lot has been achieved on the specifics. But I think he, interestingly today, it'd be good, uh, particularly given Madeleine and Francis's views, to see how others see us uh, in the, the UN, uh, actually brought out a report in February 2019, last year, uh, broadly saying that so far as global Britain was concerned, there was simply no clarity on what global Britain means. So the, today's objective is not to be on a downer, not to be criticized in the government, but to see what can actually be made of the global Britain concept. Madeline, your thoughts would be most welcome. I'm struggling with your injunction to be positive because <laughs> listening as an outsider now to uh, the Intelligence and Security Committee report, I was devastated because we have quick, relert, quick alert, uh, quick reaction aircraft that head into the skies whenever anyone unknown approaches our airspace, where we see threat, we respond. And yet here we had a report that demonstrated when you get a penetration into our politics, our economy via our insurance markets, legal services, property, energy, disinformation, bot factories, we do nothing. And it, that was all over the media around the world. And the damage that did to an image of a successful outward facing global Britain, I'm deeply concerned about. Uh, I think it's the issue of finite finances and resources is becoming very, very real. And I'm also very worried about the concept of a global Britain when we're increasingly having a divided Britain. So I'm, I'm trying to think of positives and the positives have to be the strengths of our institutions and the institution's capacity over many years to weather storms. This is going to be an extremely difficult storm with both the damage of COVID and the damage of Brexit. And the damage to our reputation, but I think we do have, if we pull it together, and if government lets us pull it together, we do have the capacity to do that. So that's my bit of positivity, my clip the end, sorry. Thank you, Madeline. Francis, your thoughts on, on the, the, the uh, thematic question? Um, I will address this specifically from a, a defence point of view. Um, we should bear in mind that despite 20 years of expeditionary warfare, Iraq, Afghanistan, the UK has sort of been absent from most of the world since what? Uh, withdrawal from East of Suez at the end of the 60s. Um, all this talk of the UK being an Indo-Pacific power, I, when I have conversations with people out in that region, to put it mildly, they're a little bit cynical about it. And they say, well, we ain't seen much of you for 50 years. Um, when you've been out here for 50 years, we may take you a bit more seriously. Um, to sort of go back to your comments and also Madeline's, global, global Britain, global UK from a defense point of view, I would like to see some more clarity and definition about what it actually means. And especially as uh, regards the Indo-Pacific region. And let's bear in mind, if you're at Dukham in Oman, a port developed partially to uh, base aircraft carriers at when we need to, and then you talk about Yokohama in Japan, you're what, is it seven and a half thousand nautical miles between the two? This is a significant portion of the globe, yet we hear from the MOD people just actually speak, dare I say glibly, about the Indo-Pacific region. It's massive. And yes, a 65,000 ton aircraft carrier is big. It can't be in two places at 
the same time. And if it is up with the Japanese, it's not going to be with the Indian Navy. And this lack of clarity about exactly what, from a defence point of view, global UK means, I think hampers practically every other conversation that follows it. And to go back to Madeleine's point of view specifically, the cost. And the cost of having a global deployment, and I really mean, you know, around the globe, looking at MOD figures, budgets, whatever, I can't see any evidence people have actually calculated what this global deployment is going to cost. And by the way, it will cost at the very least, and it's the Navy who have the biggest ambitions, it will at the very least cost a good few hundreds of millions of pounds a year extra at a time when that money just doesn't exist. Wow. Well, interestingly, this uh, particular slide I chose because I'm based in the city of London, as Mark indicated, and Global UK, Trade, Innovation and Culture, has been very much the theme of the Right Honourable, the Lord Mayor, Alderman William Russell this year. So we think we have a flavour of what our outward bound uh, projection and connections, it's not, not, not always projection, connections are what we're trying to do because trade needs to be a two-way street. Uh, certainly one of the things that used to bother me uh, listening to the Department uh, for Trade in its early days was we will sell to you, not we will trade with you. Anyway, let's, uh, let's move on to the next slide. And Francis, um, given where you ended, I think it might be interesting uh, for you to pick this up. This was the first of uh, the themes we wanted to look at. Okay, um, there are these ambitions. What actual contributions to international stability and security can we make in light of the financial constraints you just outlined? Um, and the financial constraints from COVID <clears throat> are going to be massive. And um, it, do you know what? It would be lovely to believe that the MOD's budget would stay the same in cash terms, uh, something the Australians have pledged, the French have come close to pledging, uh, Swedes have pledged that their defence procurement will stay the same. Um, looking through parliamentary answers earlier today, I don't get any impression that the UK will guarantee the defence budget stays at the same cash terms that it was six months ago. Um, we know GDP is going to go down. Um, coming back to my one, what's global UK? Can we have some reality here? Um, it's lovely to say we're going to be a player globally, militarily. Um, again, the Navy is the easiest one to do at the moment. Five, six years ago, if you'd said to anyone, can the Royal Navy be a globally active Navy with 19 destroyers and frigates, even the Navy would have said, not really. You know, we just don't have enough ships to cover the globe. Somehow now at the moment, with the same number of ships, a few tweaks around the edges to the maintenance regime, people are claiming we can have a global naval presence. Um, I'm finding this difficult to believe. So reality, can the UK be a major player, and this is the whole thing, reality, in the Pacific region, in the uh, Indian Ocean region, in the Gulf, in the Mediterranean, let alone, and let's be, let's come back to home base. We've got to be a power in our own backyard, the North Atlantic, the North Sea. Um, if we are not, we are kidding ourselves because the UK as a country is spectacularly undefended. Yeah, we're getting a lot of interesting uh, comments, folks. We do get your comments in early because I can tell we're going to run off the end. Uh, Laurie Mercer points out on the internet, you can travel from Japan to Oman at the speed of light, not, not to be missed. Hugh Purser points out, interesting to see both Russia and China announce huge commitments to their naval forces in the last week. Uh, Madeline, your thoughts on what actual contributions can we make? <laughs> well, do you know, our first priority actually has got to be our NATO commitments. Never mind expanding into whole new regions. We have commitments to NATO. Now, the whole of NATO's alliance is going to be massively affected by the economic downturn that's going to hit all of us. And even if those of us who promise the 2% commitment keep to that 2%, it's going to be a hell of a lot less in cash terms in terms of a percentage of GDP for all of us. The UK has a responsibility very clearly given to us by the US for the North Atlantic. I really don't know how we are going to be expanding outside of the North Atlantic where there is a major risk 
to the whole of Europe if it's not protected, if it's not controlled, and the capability to have additional support and reinforcements come from the US if there was uh, any particular real land threat from Russia. I don't know how we're going to be able to expand to go into the South China Sea. I don't know how we're going to be able to expand to help with assistance around the coasts of Africa, never mind going into the Gulf. So that's my concern. Like, like Francis, I come back to the Navy. The Navy has been massively hollowed out. And even if we were able to have the crews for those 19 ships, which we don't have, we constantly have to bring ships into port because we don't have crews to send all of them out to sea. Then we would be stretched. But this is just not realistic. It's not feasible. And I just wish we'd be honest about that because we're setting ourselves up to fail. And yeah. we've got this fine excuse. Look what's happened to our economies. Look what's happened as a result of COVID. How are we going to get the crews that are fit and well, apart from anything else? So let's have a bit of reality on all of this and stop making false promises. And this wonderful image of Britain as able to be everywhere, doing everything all the time. Let's get real. Well, that closing sentiment moves us nicely onto our next slide. And actually, it's very much in line with a number of comments I'm getting from the audience. Uh, with Kurt, from Gavin Thomas, with current uncertainty in terms of trade with USA and Europe and globally confident China and ambitious Russian, Russian Federation, does our ambition match our na national capabilities? Uh, should the UK not settle for cameo roles on the international stage? in the few areas where it may have an international reputation. Uh, Mike Maiden uh, uh, goes on, Global Britain implies a position for the UK and the world relative to others until we define our aspirations for that position and how it will manifest itself. How can we persuade others that we should be taken seriously? So what aspirations would Madeleine and Francis have for the UK? And this slide is about prioritization. Uh, I might ask, uh, Madeleine, if you wouldn't mind opening, but I'm kind of curious as well, uh, what sort of prioritization other than budgetary? We we always hear this bit about there's no money, no money, and it goes back and forth. But there are a lot of other priority uh, rankings that we could use, are there not? And you've indicated NATO, obviously, as being uh, pr prim primary for you. Hey, not just primarily for me. It's primary for the UK. Oh, it's, it's, it's central to our defense capability. So... Any idea that the UK can stand alone, defend itself and do expeditionary warfare around the globe, that went a long time ago. Not to mention the fact that our nuclear deterrent is dedicated to NATO. And it's very easy when there's financial pressure to say, oh, the deterrent, that's the one we should get rid of. I have to say again, the loss of Britain's credibility if the deterrent goes, and also the credibility of NATO's defense would be devastating. Personally, I go back to the Navy, but the other threats, quite honestly, are homeland based. And I think we have to acknowledge that we need to do some hardening and some real hard looking at ourselves in terms of the lessons to be learned from that Intelligence and Security Committee report. The disinformation campaigns at a time when we're going to be facing mass unemployment again, where inequality is seen as a, a key issue amongst the wider population, and where 45% of the terrorist threat in the UK comes from the far right. You know, that's going to grow. So we are also going to harden our internal resilience capability, as well as any deployments that we're planning to do or able to do elsewhere when we've met our NATO commitments. So that's my priority for defence. What are the security threats? 
those gray zones, those disinformation campaigns, they're going to grow. And I can see there being far more economic warfare. And Michael, that's much more your zone in a sense than mine. But I do think the threats that have come from China about the consequences of our pulling out of, uh, of Huawei and 5G with them, we have to take those seriously. And we have to look at how we're going to deal with them. You cannot destroy all the pillars of an economy. You know, uh, an agreement with the EU going, an agreement with the US going, we're damaging relationships with China. And at the same time, we've got a fantasy that we're going to be a global player, both in the defense and economic world. It mm. worries me that there's a lack of reality. Now, our role also has to be in getting out there. You know, it used to be that British diplomacy and our embassies, our foreign office people were key to our understanding of what was going on around the world and people understanding Britain. I'd like to also make a plea that we reinvest in that because we stopped listening. We've gone into telling mode and puff mode about who and what we are. And we need to do a lot more listening again and saying to people, what can we do to help rather than this is what you need. Hmm. And uh, Francis, just before I turn to you, I might interject a comment here from uh, Paul O'Neill. Given the increase in the threat in Europe and the fact that trade interests may need to be protected, how should the integrated review respond? Is it time to learn from the Australians and make the Euro-Atlantic our primary focus for defence? But how would you prioritise our defence and security threats? Um, I think Madeline's right. Let's be honest, we are key members of NATO. If, unless we are going to throw away our NATO membership, mm. That has got to be at the, the heart of what we do. After that, we have to be honest and admit that, you know, by the way, Australia is looking to increase spending on defence, even with the knowledge of COVID, to 3% of GDP by about 2030. Um, I don't know about you. I don't detect anyone in Britain talking about that realistically. Um, so you have to say, OK, we stick to ish a 2% and the, the current 2% we all know is completely fudged uh, because it includes weird and wonderfuls from all over the budget. Um, so I do think, you know, why is it in World War Two with the economy turned over completely to wartime production, we still had an agreement with the Americans that Britain and Canada would do the Atlantic? Overwhelmingly, you know, the US largely just down their, their own continental coast and the United States would cope with the Pacific. So even in those days of total warfare, both sides recognized they couldn't do everything. Why is it the Americans now have to uh, reactivate the second fleet for the Atlantic, potentially do partial reallocation of aircraft carriers to the North Atlantic when, quite frankly, they could use them in the Pacific? Something tells me, and from conversations I've had, they would quite like Britain to take leadership in the Atlantic. And I've spoken with people from the US Navy have said, what is it you guys have got with the obsession with wearing white shorts? and having cocktail parties, you know, can you can you deal with reality? Yeah, it'd be great to see you out in South China Sea, but you're not essential. It's a long way from home. So I, I also come back and Madeline's mentioned this, um, the resilience. Everyone talks about cyber and yes, you know, cyber this, cyber that. Um, I will absolutely gladly put my hands up and say my not quite last military experience, but I did about six, seven years of it was as a home defense soldier with territorials back in the 80s, early 90s. This is a skill, it wasn't regarded as such at the time, which has been completely forgotten. And I've spoken with regular since, they regard it as, oh, anyone can do home defense. Wrong. Yes. This is a skill that has to be learned and trained and practiced the whole time. The UK is singularly undefended. Bear in mind now we have, what, three fighter bases in the UK? three ports for the the, uh, the Royal Navy and a very limited number of ports for troops getting overseas. Um, I know from some work I was shown by um, 
Royal Engineers and Royal Logistics Corps about four years ago, you can bring down the Channel Tunnel Rail Link in six places with a 10 kilo charge. In terms of the permanent way leading up to the tunnel, it will take you weeks to repair that. Home defence, we don't do it. The number of single points of failure in UK defence for the homeland is massive. And there is no plan to do proper defence of the UK. And we need to recall, forget, you know, Islamic terrorism or whatever. If we are up against Russia, they got sleepers in this country. By the way, they've undertaken active uh, offensive actions against this country, Salisbury. Um, why would they not, in the time of tension, do the same again? Entirely deniable, the green men, so forth. And just as a final comment on this, I got shown a photo by a um, friend of the family. This was from Tattershall Castle, which is up in Lincolnshire. And it was a selfie, but behind the person, two Chinese with long lenses. They weren't taking a photo of the castle, they were photographing RF Coningsby. Um, what was the last figure I saw? 120,000 Chinese students in Britain. I am not trying to tar all of them with the same brush. If the percentages who are linked with you know, hostile actors are similar to what we had in the Cold War with sleepers, about 2,000 of those people are active agents of People's Liberation Army. And we need to be aware of what they might do. That would be my first one. We have, we've forgotten this area first off, NATO second, which includes the deterrent. I'm, and I'm a complete skeptic about this. The Pacific region, we are going to be a bit player. I'm looking at something I wrote uh, a few months ago. If we based one Type 45, and that's an ask, quite frankly, out in the region, we would have the same number of VL tubes, vertical launch tubes, as Indonesia. Yeah. Well, that's, that's been really helpful, be. Francis, because um, a number of people in the audience wanted us to uh, spread their remarks around from the Navy, which you kindly did on uh, bringing in uh, the Army, the RAF, Strategic Command. We also have some interesting comments here about um, our relationship with China. Uh, James say, even if our politicians don't like China, our businesses have significant opportunity. But, you know, uh, you know, how do we go about prioritizing that? Should we be pulling defense out of our Chinese relationships? Interesting issue there. Um, let's move to the last uh, theme in this uh, quick canter through uh, a, a very large area. Uh, and our final um, sort of discussion was uh, really a slide here about how can we use our reputation in history to strengthen our position as a geopolitical player? And I've got comments here from uh, some people like you, Purser, uh, talking about um, it's been our technical strength, or Bob McDowell, who believes you know it's always been our our cultural uh, offering. So there are a lot of people out here who, who believe that building a global Britain is about significantly more uh, than defense and security and some hard trade uh, agreements. Um, Madeline, would you like to talk to this briefly? Well, when I used to uh, to travel the world and, uh, and talk to countries and they'd say, they'd ask me what Britain's got to contribute. I would say, well, you should always listen to the British because there isn't a mess we haven't made. There isn't a mistake we haven't made. And there isn't a situation that we haven't made worse, but somehow we've kept going. And so you should listen to us because we can say, well, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> we tried that. And that was what it led to. So actually, our history and our reputation is of making mistakes and learning from them and moving forward. And that's the one thing I suppose I cling on to at the moment. It was interesting I was, when I was in Pakistan and I was, uh, I was meeting a government minister. and. He, we were talking about education and he said when the brits left uh, we destroyed the system that you'd left us with because uh, we didn't want anything to do with the colonial power and now we're having to try and put it back so what we are good at is actually building systems and we are good at building some of the systems that countries need 
to be effective. Um, in particular, legal systems and having rule of law as central to the protection of the state. So sometimes we have to think outside the box of what we see as our reputation and our history, because actually our intelligence services are trusted, our diplomacy still counts. Our military has a high reputation, but it's way too small. Our legal system still has major reputation, sort of going back to maritime. Something like 80% of global maritime disputes are still settled in the UK. So it's that it's that trust in our establishments that I worry that the Intelligence and Security Committee report has shown has been weakened and damaged, which is why I've talked about the need to go back and rebuild and protect them and to have some honesty about how we weakened them and why we weakened them. And we weakened them because of our politics, not because the institutions were themselves weak, because they're not, they're strong. But our politics has been derailed and has become much more about what's right for um, the leadership of our political parties. And I can say that in all honesty, having gone through a leadership of a political party where that was a real problem for us. And we need to get back to leadership that looks at what's right for Britain because we have the institutions there that are solid and sound and strong it's our politics I think that's a major problem for us at the moment well I think we'll be coming back to that in the uh, quite soon but just before, just before I hand over to Francis uh, for his comments Francis I've got a couple of people here um, who'd like to have at least a small US angle on this. Roger sure. Bass points out that Secretary Pompeo remarked a few days ago about building an alliance of democracies this is an opportunity for the Commonwealth and indeed for global Britain. Robert Kahn, who I believe is dialing in from America, talks about the cost of poor leadership, uh, both in the US and the UK. Uh, is, is Biden actually going to be a positive move if he's elected? So with those uh, running around the back of your head, how do we use our reputation in history to strengthen our position? Um, I think uh, working on the back of what Madeline said, that th there are some very good bits of reputation and history but again, if we're looking back at the Pacific region, my perception is a lot of the countries say, Britain, you've not been here for 50 years. Hmm. Um, yes, in, was it 2018, 2019, we had three frigates go through the Pacific. And the general sound was a very slow hand claps in Australia going, whoopee, they're nothing. We've got to accept that if we are talking about uh, reputation history, in the Asia Pacific region, and again, I can only really properly speak from a defense point of view, our reputation's pretty low. Um, yes, was it one, two years ago, the Royal Air Force had four, six typhoons out in Japan for the first ever air defense exercise since 1945. And the next one's not due for another three, four years. Perceptions matter, and the answer is yes, we're a bit player. Britain has global interests, we are not militarily a global player. And I think this is one of the problems we've got at the moment is balancing those two absolute truths, which is yes, trade-wise, whatever, Britain has these interests. We do not have the influence militarily that the United States has. If you wanted my um, definition of what a global military power is, it is one that can deploy and sustain near indefinitely significant military forces without destroying the rest of the force structure. I add that last bit because in both Gulf 1 and Gulf 2, the rest of the force structure was gutted to create a force to go out to the Middle East. And, you know, we were lucky in 1990, the Cold War was over. Because if the Cold War had still been going on, Russia could have basically yanked our chain pretty easily. Um, again, coming back to Madeline's point, should we be 
better on diplomacy, intelligence. Uh, was it uh, yesterday, day before? I think it was Japan asking whether it could join the Five Eyes. Mm -hmm. Yes, that type of thing we should really be looking at. Um, again, I would just come back to the basic one of let's be realistic from a defense point of view, what we can do. Because uh, there's an old saying in defense industry uh, about projects, always um, under promise and over deliver. So never claim you're going to be uh, giving to the user an aircraft that will defeat, defeat Imperial Star Destroyers in two years time. You're not gonna be able to do it. Never over promise. And I think this is the, the big issue and trying to work out what is realistic between all of the levers, security, military, intelligence, uh, culture, you name it, what can we do? Um, and by the way, just as a very last point on the culture, the soft power, coming back to my point about uh, Chinese students taking photos of Coningsby, um, yes, our education system, we get loads of people coming from overseas. Are we aware of how many of them are actually benign? Yeah. Well, um, a big smorgasbord there, folks. <laughs> Uh, and some comments. So, uh, uh, Philip Leone, three frigates. Heck, if we had 30 frigates, what difference would it make? No consequence globally. Um, we've got uh, an interesting comment by Christopher Samuel. Without the armed forces, as professionals, uh, being able to speak, the media and public are ignorant. I think uh, uh, for Mark Lee, it's a commendation that these types of discussions are uh, coming out. I think it's important that, that we have a look at it uh, and that we understand it. Um, I, a little closing question before I turn to a couple of comments from people I'd like to bring in um, for both of you, you know, sort of 60 seconds. This is from Isabel Hilton. The government talks about UK leadership undefined. To be a leader implies there are followers. Can anyone see any? Madeline? Oh, oh dear. Um, oh, it's very difficult, isn't it? Because you look at the UK right now, and the chaotic sort of leadership that came out of government in terms of um, the strategy for dealing with COVID was so bad that people ended up just making up their own rules and deciding, well, this is what I'm going to do. So leadership is also about having a sense of direction, but it's also about a sense of where you want to go. People have often got grand ideas about um, what they want to do, but they're not very good about how they're going to take people with them to achieve that. We seem to have lost that. Um, again, we seem to have gone through periods of death leaders in this country who aren't even listening to their colleagues in Westminster right now. And they most certainly weren't listening to colleagues in Westminster under the previous prime minister. So it's important to start listening when you're a leader and not just saying and promising things that you're not going to be able to achieve. And in terms of our soft power, and in terms of bringing some reality into Britain, can I just again suggest that people start listening to the World Service, the BBC World Service? Because we get ourselves reflected back and it's so important that you understand how the rest of the world is faring before you start telling them what to do and how to do it and we have fallen into that trap over and over again so i'll, I'll stop there because you wanted us to be brief michael and Francis, um, I mean, this, uh, this point which Madeline's making, which I, I totally agree with, how might we go about assessing what people really think of us? Well, A, you have to be brutally realistic and understand that people may not see us in the light we see ourselves. Let me come across a, a very recent one, which was reported in the newspapers, this whole basing an aircraft carrier out in the Indo-Pacific region, 7,000 miles across. Um, and don't worry, we don't need frigates because the locals will provide the defense. And oh, don't worry about the aircraft because the Japanese will provide the aircraft. Um, it was a wonderful, uh, Eliza Doolittle, do oh, wouldn't it be lovely um, type of view. Honestly, I cannot believe, um, you know, my conversations with people out in uh, the whole of that region, 
they're going, oh yes, you send an aircraft carrier with no defense, no aircraft, you expect us to do all the work, that's not leadership. Um, sadly, from a defense point of view, if you want to be a leader with, you know, with an aircraft carrier, you have to have a carrier group based out yeah. in the region. And the UK simply does not have the money, the resources, as Madeleine's pointed out, the crew to do this. And um, you know, how many times in military history is it pointed out, you know, idiocy is trying to do something you know you're going to fail at? Um, again, be realistic. Out in Asia, they're going, yeah, Britain, you've, you've not been out here for 50 years. So the old frigate turning up, thank you very much. It's awfully nice, but we're not necessarily changing our defense policy. And certainly my reading of both the recent Japanese white paper and the Australia 2020 uh, strategic review. By the way, if, you, if people have not read that document, the Australian one, please go out and download it. Yeah. It is a document I wish the Ministry of Defense was in a position to publish because right. its clarity is just amazing. Um, if, if we, from a defense point of view, it's the only point I can uh, press. We've just got to have larger armed forces, but no one has yet been able to make the case of why we should spend the money. Francis, if you wouldn't mind, please do send to that document link to us and we'll make sure it is posted on the site. Uh, Matt, I was just about to turn out to Claire, but go ahead. I, I just wanted to say it's about the conversations that we're having. What's happened is that governments start talking to the party faithful. And what they're trying to do is follow public opinion rather than actually lead. So there was a, a report today about how much the government has spent on public opinion polls just in the first seven months of this year. We tend to forget that when we're talking to party faithful and the British public, that the rest of the world can largely speak English. We're not able to read their papers, but they can read ours. And I used to sit on the bus with NATO colleagues and see them reading the Sun and the Telegraph and the Mail during the Brexit debates and them laughing. We have to remember the world has a vote. It's not just we have a vote. Sorry, Michael. No, nope, it's delightful. Um, I'd like to ask at the moment um, a couple of comments from the audience and a teed up Claire Lockhart, who's the CEO at the Institute of State Effectiveness. Uh, Claire, your thoughts uh, in a minute or so on what you've just heard. Um, four quick points. Um, first, really agree with the perspective of realism, um, but I'd like to propose a, two notes of caution on this as the UK approaches these choices. Um, there's, um, in, in the US a few years ago, there was the Y memo, the VX memo, which sort of advocated that the US should focus on unity at home and rebuilding at home. And I don't think this crowd is going to, to fall for that, but I think it was very much a trap. You can't focus at home and not abroad. So I think the engagement abroad is absolutely the right track. Um, and I think the need for division of labor, absolutely, which may call for a regional focus, but how at the same time does the UK keep its eyes and, and thinking at least strategically on the global level, which brings me to my second point, what is needed from the UK, and I think is the new uh, global Britain concept, this, you know, wh what is the roadmap? What are the principles for an international rules-based order? Um, and the UK's collectively and individually sort of strategic thinking contributing to that debate, I think is going to be absolutely crucial. Is it a reassertion of the post-World War II order? Is it an updating of it? And how do we update it? And how do we connect to rising generations who didn't grow up in, in the aftermath of World War II to make it meaningful? And I think the UK's thinking and then help with articulating that is going to be absolutely crucial. And then, of course, we do need to, as Madeleine says, get specific about this. What does this mean? And what does this mean for the updating of the UN, the World Bank, NATO, other international organizations? But what does this mean for new coalitions, um, especially with a rising um, Russia, China specifically, and, and 
threats from Russia. And then third point, you know, where are the UK's strengths? At ISC, we always like to think of doing an asset map, which is probably a little bit like a capabilities map in the, in the defense world, but just tremendous. And looking at this, I'm mean, British of origin, but been out for a long time, the UK still has just tremendous, tremendous assets to contribute. And so many of them don't actually need a lot of money. And again, it's back to that strategic thinking. It's about the rules, the rule of law, the system building that Madeleine talked about. And I think when we look also broader, a concept of the UK that goes beyond governments and government institutions, it's the media, it's innovation, it's academia, it's the city of London. And I think when the rest of the world thinks about Britain and its capabilities, often it's it's the government, but it's that much broader um, complex. Um, and then maybe finally, you know, obviously there'll be continued intelligence and defence updating of what the threats and opportunities are. And at the moment, it all, all eyes on China, Russia, Iran, and so on out of the US um, national you know security strategy. Um, but I think this new concept of the grey zone is, is an important one. Um, my work has looked over the last couple of decades at the so-called fragile states, but I think we are going to see a new zone of competition for those countries, similar to maybe echoes of, of the Cold War. And that's where the new merger of dip it into the foreign office, I think, becomes really crucial. Who's going to be building the critical infrastructure in those countries and what kind of development and security concept and partnerships are we going to be offering them are going to be really crucial as, as part of this. So again, urge a, a, a focus on, on the world as well as the region. Over from me. Fantastic. Um, and I'm asking uh, Paul Spedding from BAE Systems. Paul, a couple of comments from you, please. Um, I, I, okay, thank you very much. Well, for, first, just thank you to the to the to the panelists and to City Forum and the team again. Um, I, I think my first reflection is: last year when we ran these events, we never envisaged that this year they would be virtual. And, and I think if we'd have anticipated that they would be virtual this year, we would not probably have anticipated they would be effective. Uh, and they have. And I think, I think if if nothing, perhaps it is it is going to help us envisage the increasing relevance of our digital future and, and uh, what is the global economy. Um, I'd like to really come back to the cyber security aspect that, uh, that Francis touched on. And, and Madeline mentioned some of the strengths around our strong reputational areas in, in systems and institutions, our legal institutions, our intelligence institutions. And all of these things are very essential for supporting business. And I'm looking for a little bit more positivity. I've, I've really enjoyed this, but I don't think it's been, I don't think we've got to a very positive place as, as we're looking forward. And I, I sort of, I, I'm a little bit of an optimist, so I sort of think we will. I, I believe from my experience that the UK already has a very strong reputation for cyber security, but it is uh, every day, you know, we are seeing new headlines and the virtual world is becoming a very dangerous place to do business, but it's where we're going. And if, if the panel like me believe that having a deserved reputation for cybersecurity will become one of those differentiators in enabling Britain to take a global lead in a digital future, then where do they think uh, amongst the elements of our national cyber strategy, that's the government, critical national infrastructure, business, uh, industry, public, by which I include education, where do we think we should be most up in our game? <laughs> Good. We've got a lot of comments out here from the audience, um, and they, they range on things uh, like, for example, a uh, lot of people actually not just about cybersecurity, but really owning these information trade highways as much as defending them. Uh, so very much in line with your points there, Paul. Um, I myself this morning was uh, just having a, a look at some of the statistics we have in the city about the attacks on just intellectual property, and the scale of it is breathtaking, absolutely breathtaking. Uh, to see how organized some of this is. We have people here wondering if we should have national service coming back. Uh, lots more comments about uh, the Commonwealth as an important area, uh, the importance of uh, being uh, open and honest with our allies. Our, our whole defense is based on an alliance structure, uh, not a single structure. So a whole bunch of things coming up. But I'd like to pick up in the limited time available with uh, Francis and Madeline. Uh, really a point here that comes uh, in, in two ways, really. You talked about politics undermining the very strength of our system. So uh, the legal system, civil service, the media, uh, to, name, to, to name a few. Uh, this is coming uh, really uh, via Hugh Purser. And uh, we also have a comment from Mike Stanmet. So how can, we, uh, how can Britain manage a sensible reduction 
in its global appetite to be doing to be in too many places and doing too many things so our media keeps whipping us up we find that everything needs to be addressed all at once which is too much how, how can we pull this into a sensible conversation where we can get someplace Francis, you want to start oh gosh um in the time allocated it's absolutely impossible uh, the services specifically with the mod have done such a bad job of selling their their case over the last two decades it's going to take time to repair the damage but i use that advisedly i don't think people in the mod have yet still understood how much iraq and afghanistan have poisoned the public appetite for global stuff military stuff and that is going to be a poisonous legacy for five years, 10 years. Um, national service, if you'd asked me 10 years ago, I'd have said, just forget it, it's never going to happen. Um, when you see what the Nordic countries are doing with expanding national service, I can start to see a case, if it is done properly, which now destroys everything I've just said, um, for some form of national service to come back. Uh, it would be deeply unpopular with the regulars, um, and I come back to the fact it would not be done properly. <sighs> the solution to the UK's defence global profile is not just more money, because at the moment, as is sadly very evident, if you were to give the MOD more money, they would waste a lot of it. And in a relatively recent conversation with Ber Sir Bernard Gray, former head of uh, defense procurement, he points out, give the MOD a budget of just pretend 10 billion, they will come up with requirements of 12 to 13. Give them 12 to 13, they will come up with requirements of 15, 16. It is an insatiable beast. You have to realize that resources are finite, which brackets every other NATO country, except the United States understands. And so we've got to stop dreaming we've got to become brutally realistic about what we can do yeah there's some interesting comments here a million dead iraqis is a very poisonous legacy uh, uh which completely is a, true completely yeah, true we're, we're getting a lot of realism from you and from the audience but uh, madeline I, I i seem to want to do this to you every time <laughs> can you a positive ray of hope how do we how do we move this into a debate that gets somewhere okay well let's start with the post-COVID world, it's not going to go back to business as usual. And in terms of more money for the De Ministry of Defence, well, across government, the, the issue is going to be there's no money. So how do we look at what our strengths are? And personally, I wouldn't go for universal conscription. I'd go for selective conscription. Yeah. And I would have selective conscription that would allow people to be in the armed forces, move into business, move into the third sector, so that it, it was a more, a different sort of uh, conscription, but actually you went to look for the skills that those young people were potentially bringing with them that could be heightened and developed and promoted both for them and for the agency or organization that they joined. That's done extremely well in some of the Nordics and the Baltics. And I, you know, we can steal ideas, we don't have to make them up ourselves. Academia is going to be in serious trouble because we're going to lose those overseas students. Academia has been an absolute treasure for us. We have weakened it by putting it into a marketized system, and that's got to stop. We're going to have to look at a new structure for academia so that the brightest and the best are there to do the teaching and are there also as our students. So that when things change, we'll start attracting people back again. Climate change. We haven't mentioned climate change, but we actually have a lot to offer, both in terms of sharing green energy solutions, the importance of water and avoiding water wars in the future, we have to take a lead on water and transport. Green transport is going to become essential and looking at 
how we bring down the costs of alternative transport solutions. In terms of uh, cyber, well, and disinformation campaigns, I'd like to see Britain take a lead in clamping down on social media's management of some of this, uh, the grey zone attacks, the disinformation, and the just the horrible stuff that is out there on social media. They have to take some, we have to have a regime in the UK, and perhaps we can show some leadership here that says to social media, we will hold you responsible for your content. So either you manage it or we'll manage you through our courts. And finally, can I just say my proudest moment while I was uh, president of the NATO parliament was actually in, we were in Ethiopia and I was with a delegation and we stopped for lunch and there's a television in the room and we heard a statement from the Supreme Court on the judgment on prorogation. And I cried and I turned to them all and I said, there, I told you over and over again, if your courts aren't independent and if they don't speak truth to power, you're finished. We're still there because our courts are still free. And I would say that's the shining light that we've got to make sure that um, we keep strong. So there we are. That's my positive end. It, it is a positive end because here in the city, the, the idea, I, I still think it's underpinning independence uh, of the court system and the wider aspects, quite a few wider aspects to Ooh. rule of law. What Britain has been famous for is a reputation for uh, tolerance and pragmatism. Desmond Bowen here is saying we used to have a reputation for problem solving, reliability and pragmatic, pragmatic compromise. We need to rebuild this. And I've always believed that the strength uh, of our financial markets relies on the fact that we treat all comers fairly. Um, and that, that is not the case around the rest of the world. Francis, just to, in the time available, um, which isn't very much, we, we have a couple of comments here. Ian Sheridan uh, points out that paucity is a great catalyst for innovation. Uh, Madeline pointed out uh, climate change is one, uh, COVID and the stress on the whole economy, particularly on SMEs, uh, the limitations on budgets. So, if paucity or having your back to the wall is a mother of invention, by gosh, we've got every opportunity. Uh, how would you like to close this conversation? I, I would love to see what you've just raised actually implemented. I do not detect, uh, and yes, there are structural difficulties, and Madeline and myself agree on the nuclear side. However, it comes with a massive bill, mm. which if you did not have the nuclear side, we would be free three to four billion pounds a year, but I am in agreement with Madeleine, absolutely. We've got the nuclear side, we should keep it, and we accept the cost, um, but we just have to be realistic about everything else. No, we can't lead in the Indo-Pacific region, and actually, and I will use deliberately um, inflammatory words, trying to tell the Indian Navy if we send one ship over the Indian Ocean that we are leading them. They're just going to laugh. Um, we have to accept we are going to be in a subordinate position in the Indian Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, all around there. Um, why don't we get used to it? Why don't we accept the fact that we will be not followers, we will be allies. We won't be leaders. We will be good allies. I'm not sure this has sunk into a lot of the services at the moment. And they are trying to trade the um, Eastern dream as a reason for bigger defense budgets, which they are not going to get. So sorry, I can't be massively positive, sorry. Well, I'm going to try and draw this to a close and, and, uh, and I am actually, I end this much more positive than I began, oddly. I think I, I get some clarity here. I think the first point was that we were looking at almost a kind of do too much in business as usual. We have the almost the opposite extreme, the Switzerland, neither of those do we want. Uh, we want to basically cut our uh, our abilities to fit our cloth, uh, sorry, our aspirations to fit our cloth, which I think is there. Um, there was a comment on here, the empire is dead, get over it. 
Um, uh, and I think that's, that, that, that cuts off that one extreme, but isolationism isn't right either. Uh, Madeleine quite rightly uh, points out NATO and its importance to the UK and why we need to support it. That underscores an alliance-based approach to defense, which mm, you emphasize. Absolutely. And yeah. I think we got a tone from a lot of people that, well, let's at least do right in our own backyard. Let's own effectively you know, the Euro-Atlantic, North Atlantic place, take responsibility for that. So I thought that was uh, extremely clear. Um, I think that there were a couple other points I'd just make, and it's really in preparation for this. It was clear to me that the global Britain moniker was equally, to some degree, Euroscepticism as we turned ourselves away from Europe, uh, clearly, we were open to the world. And the question was, was that positive or was that negative? Uh, and I come out of uh, this today with a, a positive aspect, at least in defense and security, uh, that we should be there. But I'll close in the on time, actually. It's just a final <laughs> remark. It was probably the most depressing thing for me in preparation for this was that uh, UN report last year that they just couldn't make heads or tails of global Britain. And all the comments about leadership that we've spoken about I mean, we've got to lead ourselves to a point that we actually have something that is sellable, that, that says something that other people want to buy. Uh, and anybody who's in marketing knows you start by talking to your customers first uh, and then working up the proposition that they want. And I believe we have a lot of work to go on uh, to, to get that done. And that is why I, I admire Mark Lee and the City Forum, our partners, for having set this up, because that's what these discussions are about helping us to figure out what Global Britain is, what it means for our customers, our allies, and then how can we sell it. So I'd like to say thank you to everyone who helped in the preparation of this. Um, particular thanks uh, to Claire uh, and uh, also to Paul for kicking in. But my most sincere thanks are most naturally uh, to Francis and Madeline for their contributions today. Unfortunately, I can't open up and show you the vast audience out there that has actually stayed uh, throughout all of this, um, but I can give you a karmic clap on my little uh, Korean Buddhist uh, applaud meter here. So thank you very much, and thank you, the audience, for, for coming you. today. And we look forward to many more discussions. So goodbye to one and all. Bye-bye.